Welcome to the Wedding Songs Podcast, featuring newly released songs you need to know and the tried and true classics. Get song ideas from the time guests arrive until the last dance of the reception. And now your host, Matt Campbell, founder of MyWeddingSongs.com. Welcome everybody to the Wedding Songs Podcast. I'm Matt Campbell. Today we're going to be talking about Indian weddings and Indian wedding music. To help me along with that is DJ Rohit from DBI Dole Beat International. What's cool is he is based in Texas and Pennsylvania, so he has a wide variety of what music's being played in both areas. Welcome to the show, Rohit. Hello, hello. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing awesome. I'm stoked about this episode because you're a major force in the DJ industry, and so wanted to have you on to talk about Indian weddings, which is something that I'm not too familiar with with i know a little bit about so it's great to have you on the show absolutely glad to be here cool so can you just give a most memorable or a heartwarming wedding moment wow there's been so many especially over the last many many years i think one was most recently actually last week i was in kansas city doing a wedding and it was just the way the family treated me it didn't make me feel like I was just a vendor. They made me a part of the family. It was, their event started Friday, Saturday, Thursday. So I got into town Wednesday for another event. And Thursday, they had something going on at the house. The bride and groom called me. And then uh, bride's parents called me and were like, hey, we're doing something at the house. We didn't realize you were in town. Do you have plans today? And I'm like, no, no plans. They're like, oh, you do now. You're coming over. You're going to come hang out with us. You're not working. You're not doing anything. You're just going to come and just have a good time. And that's something that you really don't see as often in this industry where you get so close to your clients and clients' families where it goes from a working relationship to, hey, we're friends now. And I think that was one of my most memorable moments as of recently. That's interesting you say that because last week's episode was with DJ Dre, and he said the exact same thing. His most recent one, the family invited him to eat, and it wasn't even at a separate DJ table. It was at part of their family and their friends' table. So that's awesome that they included you in the day before. It was nice. And even Tuesday, there was a concert going on in D.C. Turns out a lot of the people that were at this wedding were going to that same concert as I was. So we all exchanged numbers, and we ended up hanging out. It's like, yo, can you believe that we just met four days ago and here we are hanging out? That's Stuff awesome. like that. It's it's not something that you see every day. Yeah. So many DJs that I've talked to, they remain friends on Facebook. Well, I think you're part of one of their most important days of their life. So you are kind of like family. Absolutely. Before we go any further, can you just please introduce yourself and tell everybody about yourself to our listeners? Hey, everybody. My name is DJ Rohit. I am from Dolby International, based in Houston, Texas. I am personally also based out of the tri-state area on the East Coast. I've been DJing for about 18 years now, since I was 10. I'm a traveling DJ. If you can think of a location, I will show up. I've done 12 different countries. I've been to 40 different states. And I just love everything that I do. That's awesome. So is your target market for all types of weddings or? So primarily Indian weddings. That is our main reach. So we try to book mainly Indian weddings, but fusion weddings are on the rise. You also have non-Indian weddings. I've done a lot of Spanish weddings. I've done a lot of American weddings. So I know the music. It's just that I'm so comfortable doing Indian weddings that it's just second nature. Talking about that, because you have so much experience, how have you had success booking Indian weddings? Social media, honestly. I think when I started, it was doing a bunch of Google ads, website ads. But over the last five, six years, it's been just all social media, making sure your keywords are correct, your hashtags, tagging the right location. And from there, I think I'm averaging five inquiries a week just through Instagram alone. That's not even what I'm getting on the back end of my CRM. It's just a random message on Facebook. Hey, I've been looking through your profile. I like your work. Are you available on this day? And then I direct them to my inquiry form. We fill that out and we schedule a call. And after that, it's just word of mouth. So a lot of the weddings I've been doing as of recently, and most of the ones that I have coming up this year have been referrals from my past clients. 
what percentage would you say is from social media that gets booked? I want to say about 50%. So I'm not really booking new leads, surprisingly. They're coming in, but by the time they come in, I've already booked a referral or a social media booking. So I want to say about... 45% is coming in from Instagram alone and the remaining 55 is coming from client referrals and word of mouth. Yeah. Word of mouth. So many business owners forget about word of mouth. It should be, like you said, at least half of your business and that's exactly what it is. So that's awesome. That means you're doing something right. I would hope so. <laughs> kind of scary if I wasn't. So let's get more into the Indian style weddings. Are, are there any unique moments for Indian weddings that other people should know? There are so many, right? Take your typical American ceremony. It is last, what, maybe 30, 35 minutes. A typical Indian ceremony, we're talking anywhere from two to four hours. And these weddings start in the morning. It's always at a specific time. Each wedding ceremony time is different for when the priest will announce the bride and groom wed. And that's an auspicious time. That when you start wedding planning, the priest is essentially the one that'll be like, hey, I think this day would be perfect for your wedding. The stars are aligning. You get, there's a lot of back end into it as far as planning the date. And then they narrow it down to the time that, hey, the bride should walk down the aisle at this time. By the time I get through my prayers and everything, or we can complete the wedding ceremony by this time. And that would be the best time. So there's multiple different important moments. There's the groom's procession. So back in the day, back in India, it was when the groom is going to go get his bride. He's traveling from his house in his town to her house in her town on foot, on horseback. It's a party the whole way. This could take a day. This could take hours. Because essentially when a husband and wife get married, the bride is leaving her maternal home and going to the husband's home. This, this is the part where the groom leaves his home to go receive his bride. Now, there's not that many hours in the day with everyone's busy schedules to be like, hey, we're going to go from, let's say, New Jersey to New York on foot, partying the whole way. I don't think I'd survive that now. So we usually do it at the venue in the parking lot. We condense it down to about 30 minutes, a uh, couple of speakers. So that's the start of the wedding day itself because Indian weddings are typically two days, sometimes three. But the actual wedding day, the groom's procession kind of kicks off the party for the groom side. And then he goes, meets the bride side at the door where they let him in. And that's kind of where the wedding festivities begin for the day. And from there you have the actual ceremony itself. Indian ceremonies are very unique because as so as of lately, a lot of the priests, while they're speaking, they're also translating because we're, again, fusion weddings are on the rise. I, think I have one this weekend. I have two this weekend. So not everybody's understanding what's going on. So these priests will take the extra 20 minutes and explain this is the next step in the ceremony. This is what this is going to signify. Or they'll have somebody else kind of translating everything as it goes on. But the bride's entrance, obviously... So we don't do the typical wedding vows, place the ring on the finger. It's rounds around a fire and predominantly it's seven. And it's not for like seven years. It's for seven lifetimes that, hey, we're getting married. I choose you. I want you for my next seven lifetimes. And that is probably the most significant moment in the ceremony itself. Then I guess my first question is, does the DJ, you mentioned the, the ceremony lasts about four hours. Is music being played during that whole four hours? Yeah. So you have obviously the key songs, the groom and his family walking down the aisle, sometimes a bridal party. Then you have the bride walking in and you would get the bride's bride to play her song. But we play a light instrumental in the background that there's an essence of music there while the priest is talking. In some cases, for some of our other weddings, we've actually had live music musician is there that will play the same thing live to kind of add a little bit more of a unique element to the whole ceremony. But there's always something playing in the background. We don't have in dead air. So there's always, always, always something at an Indian ceremony. You won't find a moment where the room is 100% quiet, especially during the actual ceremony itself. There's always something playing in the background and everyone's just kind of paying attention and, and just watching these two get married. 
when the priest talks, is his voice being projected through your speakers as well? Yes. So we would provide them with either a handheld or a lapel, a headset mic, and the same thing for, for like a standard ceremony. We just got to make sure that that because these ceremonies aren't short, that again, and, and this comes into investments as well, right? That you have a solid microphone system, you're buying quality batteries, whether they're rechargeable or, or disposable, because you need these to last a few hours nonstop. It's not your standard two people up at an altar, 20, 30 minutes top, ceremony's done. This is everyone sitting on the floor, typically crisscross, and you're going to be there for a few hours. So after the ceremony, the ceremony's four hours. What happens after the ceremony? These ceremonies typically start at like 10 a.m., 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. And we're usually done by 12.31. From there, it's family pictures. And then during that time, we're setting up for cocktail hour, we're setting up for reception, and you typically have four or five hours of a break in the middle. So it's, hey, you guys go, go rest, go eat. During that time, myself and my team were setting up the reception if it's not already set up from the night before, and we're just setting up cocktail hour. And then probably around like six to seven, you got your cocktail hour. And then from there, it proceeds on as a normal reception. So from seven to let's say midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., depending on how long these guys want to go for, it's your standard reception, speeches, dances. We just keep the ball rolling. So one question I had is, let's say you're starting at 10, you're getting done at 3 a.m. Are you pricing it even though there's a five-hour space? You have to be in that area that whole time. Are you thinking as a business owner, you have to charge for that whole entire time? Oh, absolutely. It makes no sense, right? Because even during that time, it's not like we have downtime. It's again, especially, so I'm in PA right now. If I'm traveling to, let's say, Jersey for a two-day wedding, I'm driving there usually the night before because most venues have been allowing us to come set in the night before. So I'll get there like five, six o'clock in the evening on like a Thursday, grab the guys, go set up, get all the up lights charging, program lighting, do a sound check, make sure everything works, power is good. Because these weddings aren't small. We're talking on average at minimum 250 people is considered a small wedding. And then Friday is what we call a Sangeet night. Day one is typically a Sangeet night. So Sangeet means music. So it's like dance performances, everyone's kind of dancing, drinking, eating, having a good time. There's really no speeches. So your show flow for the day essentially goes, everybody shows up, they get some drinks, we'll do a entrance for the soon-to-be bride and groom. They make their way in, and we go into performances, and you typically try to be there early because a lot of these groups want to practice in the event space. So... I'll get the phone call. Hey, can you come and play our performance track? And that's another thing that me doing a lot of these Indian weddings that we have to look at is that a lot of these bride and grooms or their family members that want to do these performances, they don't know how to make these mixes. So that's another thing that we charge for. Again, back to this Kansas City wedding, I think on our Sangeet night, we had 14 performances and each mix was probably about like two to three minutes, but each two to three minute mix had three to four songs. They would provide me with links and timestamps. I would make their mix, send it out. And then they'd be like, okay, we need to cut this out, this out, adjust this, add a little bit of this. And I did this for 14 separate mixes. And then I take it a step further because everyone's been to a lot of weddings and you end up hearing a lot of the same songs being reused. So we try to add a little bit of creativity to the mix and it's, let me custom make your grand entrance song, your guys' first dance song, your ceremony entrance music, your guys' recessional music. So those type of tracks, I, I typically put a little bit of extra time into and making sure that they're absolutely perfect. And then that's something I also give the bride and groom as well. And then, so like day two, it's so once the Sangeet is done, Sangeet is typically done by midnight, but then what most people don't realize is the bride has to be up at four o'clock in the morning. So nine times out of 10, between day one and day two, they're not really sleeping, especially the brides, because they're up at three, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning for getting ready shots. The photo video team is there. Bride's getting ready, hair and makeup. Groom getting ready shots, groomsmen shots, bridesmaid shots, family photos. Then you proceed to the broth, and that's another all-day thing. 
So even on the back end, where working with the wedding coordinators and the wedding planners and all the vendors and the decorators, making sure, hey, what do you guys need from us? How can we help? They're offering to help us. And then as you start doing these, you you end up seeing a lot of the same vendors. So it's like, oh, this is perfect. I've worked with you 20 times in the past. I know exactly how, how this is going to go. So there's never a dull moment. I think if anything, we might get two, three hours of downtime, especially between ceremony and reception for us. If we're staying at a hotel or if the venue's a hotel, we usually have two to three rooms there. And it's, let's go back, shower, change, take a nap, get ready, come back down during cocktail hour, make sure cocktail music's playing. If you're doing a single speaker or two speakers, or if you have somebody like a musician there playing, make sure that their levels are good. Do they have a sound tech? Do they need anything? And then you work your way on to the reception. Time for a quick break from the show to let you know about the wedding music letter. Are you struggling to find the wedding songs that match your personality and music style? Are you having a hard time keeping up with the new wedding songs being released? Then subscribe today to the wedding music letter by going to my website, myweddingsongs.com and clicking on the Join Now button. Every Wednesday, you'll get song ideas to build your wedding playlists. On the last day of the month, you'll get all of the new wedding songs released from the prior month. So subscribe today and join over 7,000 other engaged couples and wedding pros by going to myweddingsongs.com and joining the wedding music letter today. Now back to the show. So I, I kind of got an idea of day one, day two, you're saying the bride starts her day at 4 a.m. When do you typically have to be there at day two? And then what happens through that day and how does it end? Yeah, so day two starts off for me with a broth. So usually we're up at, if we didn't already set up for the ceremony after day one, then we're typically downstairs setting up at like five, six o'clock in the morning. And nine times out of 10, it's nothing crazy. It's four speakers, microphones, and an aux cable. It's very, very simple as far as the setup, but these guys are spending a lot of money on the wedding decor. I've seen decor budgets... Even the most simple ones, I've seen couples spending upwards of 100000 for all these different events because they want certain elements to be a little bit more extravagant than the last. So we're trying to work with decor, especially photo video team as well. What is going to be your guys' view angle of where the bride and groom is going to be? So I'm not in any of your shots and none of my equipment is in any of the shots. But then you also have those higher end weddings where they're like, oh, hey, we want full up lighting for the ceremony. We also want six moving heads doing Lico's on the walls. So we've had a lot of that. So we're downstairs typically early working with everybody, making sure that's done. And then for the groom's processional, we're also a part of that because we're providing music for this 30, 45 minute walk. On the back of a truck, we have a generator, a table, two speakers and a DJ mixer. And typically at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm trying to get the groom side riled up and ready to go. I'm on the microphone, getting them excited. We're playing music, we're dancing, trucks moving. I got somebody driving while I'm on the back of the truck, DJing live essentially. So it's like a morning set. You kind of make your way to the ceremony area. We start fairly early. So then from there, you go straight to ceremony. There's maybe five to 10 minutes, if that's sometimes between the end of the groom's procession to ceremony start time. That's me unplugging my laptop, telling the guys to break everything down, running inside, plugging in my laptop again, and making sure we're all good to go. Then from there, I'll still have like a separate laptop inside playing the background music and everything. But then I'll bring my primary laptop inside just to make sure everything's ready to go. Music's here. Then after the ceremony, you typically have a few hours to do your final touches in the reception. Unless the ceremony room is the reception room, then it's okay, ceremony's done. Start breaking down, start staging subwoofers, trusses. If we're doing a video wall, then waiting for decor to break down, mainly waiting for the photos to get done so decor can break down and I can start setting up trussing if I'm doing a dance floor. Then you do your reception and then we're done. Nine times out of 10, we're done by by midnight. And Mm -hmm. then depending on how crazy our setup is, it could take anywhere from 30 minutes to two and a half hours to break down. If I'm close enough to home, I'm probably driving home that night or I'll go up to the hotel room and I'll go back to sleep. But then that's typically our standard wedding weekend. Their festivities usually start on a 
Friday and everything and Saturday and then Sunday's a rest day for everybody. Yeah, that's interesting. That hasn't really caught on much. I've heard UK DJs DJing throughout a whole day, but the traditional American weddings seem like it's, you know, four to six hours only. I wish. I yeah. wish. Sometimes I wish. I try to make sure, especially when bride and grooms are doing the consultation and they're like, hey, we want to go past this time. Or, are you okay with them? Like, yeah, absolutely. We can do our contract until midnight, but if you guys want to extend two hours, here's our hourly rate. We have to make sure that, that the hotel's okay with it. But a lot of the hotels that we're doing, they know how our weddings go. And then I'm a preferred vendor at a lot of them as well. They know if I'm coming in, even if our end time is midnight, I'm not ending up at night. I'm probably going to go over at least 10 minutes because if the crowd's having a good time and I kill the music at 12, everyone's doing your standard one more song chant. And then my last song goes on for 10 minutes because I'm quick mixing. I'm playing 20 second clips for about 10 more minutes because at the very end, I'm like, Oh, I should have played this. I should have played this. So I used that last 10 minutes to get everything that I wanted to play in. Get everybody excited. Everybody, thank you for being here. Don't drink and drive. Get through that spiel. And then everyone leaves. And then after parties are now becoming a thing. Reception after parties where like the bride and groom grab their friends. Heck, we did a parking lot after party in Kansas last week. Reception ended at 2 a.m. And then bride and groom grabbed me and dragged me outside. They're like, you don't need to break down. You, you got a team here for that. You're going to come party with us now. I think we were outside in this parking lot of this conference center at the hotel till 6 a.m. And there was maybe 40 of us. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. Lots of work, but lots of fun. Rewarding. I see it be re yes. yeah, rewarding. Very, very re rewarding. So let's get more and a little bit into the music. Do you think that the heritage of the couple and the family dictate the type of music that's played? In India, you have, I think, 60-some-odd languages, some that are very common, some that are not so common. And you have about 227 different dialects. Regional music in India is very key because something that I'll play at one wedding, again, back to Kansas. I did two separate weddings. Surprisingly, they were all at the same hotel. The music I was playing at the first wedding, I couldn't play that at the second wedding because they wouldn't understand what was going on and vice versa. So knowing where your couple's from, what state in India that they're from, this is very important during your standard consultation calls and just getting to know them. It's what type of music do you guys want? Do you guys have a specific taste? What languages do you speak? What languages do your parents speak? Your, fa your family members, what do they know? What type of music do they like? So music is all regional based on where the family's from. So doing weddings in America, is there a common style of Indian music that you always, I mean, everybody hears the word Bollywood, but is there other uh, like Sanjeet and, and other styles of music that you commonly see? Five or Six main types of music I'll play. So Bollywood is one. And Bollywood is, is your standard Bollywood music. Then you got Punjabi music. That's another style. That's more like folk type village music. And those weddings are always fun. And then there's Gujarati music. And then you got the few states in South India. Those are predominantly the four or five different types of music I'll play. But then you'll get something hit you from left field where it's like, hey, do you have some of this music? I'm like, no, but I can find some. Because a lot of the wedding ceremonies, no matter how similar they are, because every state has their own type of ceremony. They have their own traditions, the own way that they do things. Even though everything's similar and I'm familiar with a lot of it, I might not know it. I'll be the first one to come out and say that. It's like, I don't know everything about every single ceremony because everyone's different, right? It is not even based on the family. It's based on the priest because the way that the priest learned, they'll do ceremonies always differently. I've never seen any two Indian ceremonies, surprisingly with, within the same family, be the same because they always use a different priest. Well, if somebody were to come up and request a song that you're unfamiliar with, do you find that they're pretty forgiving because there is so much music choices? Oh, absolutely. Especially, I do a lot of South Indian weddings as well. I'll get hit with songs that I don't know. I'm like, okay, let me find this song. Let me download it. But to me, it's... For a lot of American music, we look at BPMs. And we look at the tone of the music and the style of the music. And from there, you can kind of gauge what type of party song it is. Right? You could take something like Hotel Room Service. You, It's like 130 BPM. 
It's a pretty danceable track. And that's kind of what we play at American Weddings. Then you get into the lower beat, 60, 70 beat, hip hop stuff and R&B and pop. But for like a lot of the Indian music, especially South Indian music, when, when you hear it, it doesn't sound like a party song. Some of them sound like something. I would play this during cocktail hour. And because I don't know the language, I don't know. So I'm usually at the family's mercy at this point where it's like somebody comes up, say, hey, can you play this? And I'm like, yeah, I'll figure it out. I'm going to play the track because if I don't know the language, because they all listen to Bollywood. But when you're doing the South Indian wedding, they want their music as well. And if I don't know it or if I don't already have it, I'll find it. I always do. And I'll play it. But then at that point, I'm watching the crowd at the same time. I'm watching them like a hawk. Most times these tracks work out fantastic. But and then that's when I just make a note. And it's like, OK, this song works. And I just color code everything inside of Serato. These songs are good for dance floor. These songs are good for cocktail. These songs are offensive. Please do not play them. So everything is color coded. I love taking song requests for the weddings where I don't know the language because I'm also learning at the same time. And I'm a music hoarder. I know everyone's on this whole flatten your hard drives, get rid of all the excess. And I'm in a unique position where I can't always do that. Because you're going to get that one wedding again where, hey, all the stuff that you played at this one wedding a year ago, you're going to need all of that again. So it's not like download all this music and get rid of it. It's you should probably hold on to this because we do a lot of open format events as well where you get multiple different types of crowds. So you want to keep everybody happy at the same time. Well, and, and like you said, you're creating crates for that region or that state, yes. that ceremony, you know, cocktail hour dancing. Yeah, I'd be hanging on to them too. Just for the average DJ, are there any go to hits for most Indian weddings? I think. The one everybody knows is Punjabi MC's uh, Beware of the Boys. That's usually a go-to. I think that's one that like everybody knows. But out, outside of that, it's really up to the couples because you could do two Indian families for two separate weddings where they're from the same state, but they don't listen to the same music. So each wedding, I'm playing something different every time. Maybe some songs end up being repeated from my last wedding to this one, but nine times out of ten and these guys are very up to date when i mean up to date is if a song got released at eight o'clock in the morning and somebody in the wedding found it that song travels and then at the reception like you'll play this song like, when did this come out they're like oh about nine hours ago i'm like are you kidding me it's like no trust me it'll work i'm like okay and turns out that's probably going to be one of the top songs for the next five years and it happens every single time there's new music coming out daily yeah, it's unfortunate we're living in an age. Somebody asked at a DJ board recently, the songs you're playing right now, what's the chances you're going to be playing them in five or 10 years? And man, I'd say most of them are highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah, it's always something new. I try to be unique, play something different. Or And I do a lot of research. I do a lot, a lot, a lot of research. Because even as wedding entertainers, we get bored too, right? Playing the exact mm -hmm. same stuff every single weekend in the same way so I, I try to find different ways to present the music to the clients to the crowd but at the same time i'm doing research and i'm finding new stuff every day so leading up to the wedding i'm custom making their dinner crate their dance floor crates and the dance floor crates aren't even has everything in it it's a few songs to kind of get my mind working and then from there i'm using that search bar and typing in a song because I could play something I'm like oh this song would go very well with this and then I'm just typing away the whole night and then by the end of the night I'll take everything I play to make a new crate and be like this is a unique dance floor that I did because nothing was pre-planned like you said every family is going to be different so when you're saying search are you using Google to find your music what sources are so, you using so a lot of the music I already have I could play, let's say, for like a fusion wedding, I'm doing Mo Bamba. There's a few Indian tracks in that BPM, especially if you're using something like Serato Stems or just Stems in general, where the lyrics of an Indian song would go very well over that beat. So you would kind of just swap the vocals and then work your way from there. And that creates a whole new vibe in the room because a lot of the parents don't know American music and a lot of the Indian weddings, they want American music. So to keep parents happy as well, especially at the start of the dance floor, it keeps everybody engaged where, hey, I'm playing a beat of a song everybody knows 
are the younger crowd knows, so they're dancing. But the lyrics are from a song from the 60s or like 70s. So now you got families, uncles, aunts, grandparents also being engaged. And that's kind of a trick that I use to keep my dance floor fairly full. I think that's a really important tip that you gave that I have to hammer home is it's not all Indian music and Indian speaking music. It's mixed in with Americanized music as well, like you were oh, saying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's American music. A lot of our crowds are really getting into Spanish music. And it's not your standard suavemente or like PayPal's. They're finding stuff that I've never even heard of. And I'm like, yo, this is amazing. Hotel staff, venue staff, catering staff. A lot of these guys speak Spanish. I make friends very quickly. If I know, hey, these guys will love Latin. If a couple love like Latin music, then not only am I doing my research, talking to Latin DJs and everything, building my crates, I'm also talking to the vendors that, speak spanish hey this is the list that they gave me what oddball song can you think of that might work with this i am always open to suggestions there's, there's a lot of djs that are like i know what i'm doing don't tell me what to do but i'm like yo i don't know everything i'm fairly good at what i do but i don't know everything every wedding is a learning opportunity because you end up learning something whether it's a few new tracks that they're like yo i could use that at a wedding coming up you always learn something i mean the saying that i was told growing up is the day you think you know it all and you don't need to practice or you don't need to learn anymore is the day you need to stop. Totally agree. It's funny you say that. I, one of the questions I, I was going to ask was, what would you tell a DJ not to do at an Indian wedding? And you've kind of answered that by saying, don't think you know it all. Well, one thing you should know is understand their background. So there's different states. There's some parts in India where drinking is banned. They want nothing to do with alcohol, not even the music. Especially during your groom's procession, you're usually outside of a temple. You can't play anything that has to do with like, alcohol. You can't play any music that has to do with drugs. Knowing your client's background, where they're doing the ceremony, what type of music they want, doing the research is important. So if you're doing, especially for our Muslim crowds, Muslims just don't drink. It's frowned upon. We don't play any music that pertains to alcohol drinking. We stay completely away from those because playing something like that is deemed offensive. The younger people might not care, but then that's when you get family members, uncles and aunts that are seen as elders. So the elders inside of our community, they're very knowledgeable people. So everyone looks to them for advice. Whatever they say ends up being law. As long as they're happy, you're not doing anything to offend them, anybody else. Somebody could have just flown over for this wedding. And from over there to over here, it's completely different. So you don't want to offend anybody in the room. You have to do the research. You have to do the research. If the couple says, hey, stay away from this type of music, you should probably stay away. Even though you think it'll work, you should probably stay away because you're going to end up doing something that you're going to regret in the long run. Like you were saying, word of mouth, you could damage your reputation. Very quickly. Families talk as well. Like If you think one family won't know the other family, think again, because somebody probably does. And word travels super fast. I think that's a, a great way to end it. So is there something we missed that you wanted to share that we didn't cover? I think we nailed on everything that I can think of off the top of my head. It was a, a great conversation. I, learned, I, I definitely learned a lot about the culture and I didn't realize there were so many states and I was just thinking there was maybe four or five different styles of music, but Many different types, mm -hmm. many different types. So where can listeners connect with you and contact you? Instagram is probably the best place. My handle is at DJ Rohit Goswami, spelled D-J-R-O-H-I-T-G-O-S-W-A-M-Y. Awesome. Well, thanks, Rohit, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Stay tuned for next week for another interview with another wedding pro. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wedding Songs Podcast. Never miss a future episode. Subscribe today to our podcast. Follow us on Facebook at My Wedding Songs and send us a message about playlists you would like covered.